Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, May 23rd, 2022, and we are live. Call the numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, so um, I posted an article on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, uh, today, uh, dealing with Black Panther 2, Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever, which debuts uh, November 11th, 2022. And this was a uh, brief interview with uh, Letitia Wright, who plays Shuri in the Black Panther series, the uh, younger sister of uh, T'Challa, Black Panther. And uh, Letitia Wright says Black Panther 2 will be an incredible honor to chat with Bozeman. We'll talk a little bit about that on today's show, let you hear what she had to say. We know back in August 20, uh, August uh, 2022, Chadwick Bozeman passed away from uh, colon cancer. OK, and people have been trying to figure out, OK, so how are they going to deal with this in the film Black Panther, et cetera. OK, but. We'll talk a little bit about this and let you know what we know so far. All right. And then also a story I did not get a chance to get to um, last week. We'll talk about today. And this deals with the three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. And uh, them receiving a one million dollar donation. Three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre receive a one million dollar donation. And uh, their lawsuit continues. Their lawsuit for reparations for restitution uh, continues for the Tulsa race massacre. OK, they had to leave their homes. They had to flee and uh, lost everything that they owned. Uh, three survivors of Tulsa race massacre received one million dollar donation. Uh, and this uh, donation came from uh, Ed Mitson, Mitson, co-founder of the New York-based uh, nonprofit organization Business for Good. So we'll talk about that uh, also. There's something um, really good that happened. And I saw, you know, I saw some news stories on it. Um, I think there should be more coverage on it, but I did see some uh, news stories on it um, as well. OK, so we'll talk about that also. All right. Now, on the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. OK, be sure to register for the online uh, classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. I teach uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So there was an article that I saw from uh, OKPlayer.com. There's one from Variety.com and also one from OKPlayer.com. Uh, if we look at this one here first from uh, okplayer.com. Uh, Letitia Wright says Black Panther 2. Uh, Letitia Wright says Black Panther 2 will be an incredible honor to chat with Bozeman. And uh, Variety, uh, Variety magazine caught up with Letitia Wright uh, on Sunday, May 22nd, um, an event, and asked her about this. Now, Chadwick Bozeman's uh, legacy. Is, is a driving force behind the Black Panther series, a driving force behind the Black Panther series, while attending uh, Caring's uh, Women in Motion dinner at the Cannes Film Festival on Sunday, May 22nd, 2022. Uh, Letitia Wright, who plays Shuri in the film Black Panther, spoke with uh, Variety Magazine about Black Panther 2 and honoring Chadwick Boseman who we know died of colon cancer August 20th, uh, August 20th. She said, it's an incredible honor. Uh, it's an incredible honor for Chadwick Bozeman. It's jam packed with exciting stuff. We're going to go to a uh, clip one on Twitter uh, in just a second, Shakita. 
She said, we honored him by committing ourselves to the story that he started, the legacy that he started with this franchise. Okay, uh, let's go to this clip here. I want you to hear some of what uh, Letitia Wright had to say. And we'll get that clip queued up there. This was like on the set. I can't even imagine what you all went through as a family there. We honored him by committing ourselves to the story that he started, the legacy he started with this franchise. And we just committed every day to working hard, no matter what circumstances we faced. And we faced a lot of circumstances, um, a lot of difficult situations, but we came together as a team and we, we poured everything into this movie. So I'm excited for you to see it. How did you honor Chadwick on the set? I can't even imagine what you all went through as a family there. We honored him by committing. Okay. All right. You can. All right. Okay. So that was um, Letitia right now. If we go back to this article from uh, okplayer.com, um, it also talks about a rumor that was spread about Letitia Wright dealing with the set of Black Panther 2. Returning to the Black Panther sequel, Letitia Wright will reprise her role as Shuri, who's an engineer and she's brilliant. She creates all these inventions. She's the younger sister to to T'Challa, to, to, uh, to Black Panther. Although, to top, although the character of T'Challa will not be recast based upon what we know now. Now, during Black Panther 2 filming, which was held in Atlanta. Now, we know the first Black Panther movie, it was filmed at Tyler Perry Studios. It was the first movie filmed at Tyler Perry Studios. So, um, you know, Atlanta is really like Wakanda because Tyler Perry is African-American. He owns his own studio and, you know, Atlanta's like really like Wakanda. Uh, reports surfaced uh, dealing with uh, the set of Black Panther 2. Reports surfaced that uh, Letitia Wright was spreading anti vax views on, on the set of Black Panther 2. Okay. Rumors the actress said were completely untrue. Rumors she said were completely untrue. Okay. Now she posted about this on uh, Instagram in. Um, in October of 2021, she posted about this on Instagram. I'm going to pull up her Instagram post here because they don't have the hyperlink in this article. Uh, let's go to her uh, Instagram page. Let me flip over to this here and let you see what she said. Because I saw stories about this floating around. It didn't really make any sense. Um, so... She posted here on Instagram. This was back in October 2021. Uh, she says, God bless you all. It saddens me to address the reports published. Let's see if we can increase the size of this. Okay. Um, All right, let's reduce the size. It saddens me to address the reports published by the Hollywood Reporter on October 6, 2021. The report spoke about my conduct on the set of Black Panther 2. I honestly assert that this was completely untrue. I honestly assert that this was completely untrue. Anyone who knows me or has worked with me knows that I work incredibly hard at my craft and main and and my main focus is always to do work that's impactful and inspiring that has been and will continue to be my only focus I will continue to hold on to God's hands and onto the scripture Isaiah uh, 54 17 I continue to focus on my healing Thank you for your prayers. And I continue to pray for God's love, peace and joy for you all. God bless you, Letitia. OK, so you can follow her on. Um, you can follow her, uh, Letitia, right on uh, Instagram. OK, so those uh, rumors were false. All right, because I, I heard them and I like I said, this doesn't make any sense. You know, so I'm glad those rumors were false. Now. 
Uh, we know that, let's see, uh, Latin, in August of 2021, we know that uh, Letitia Wright suffered uh, an injury on the set of, um, she sustained, sustained minor injuries on um, the set of Black Panther 2. It was an onset accident and filming was shut down in November of 2021 to give the actress time to recover. Resuming in uh, mid-January 2022, production for Black Panther 2 completed in March of 2022. Confirmed stars in the sequel include Winston Duke, uh, Daniel Kaluuya, uh, Danae, uh, Danae Guerrero, Angela Bassett, Dominique Thorne, and Michaela Coel. All right. Uh, we know it uh, is going to be in theaters no November 11th, 2022. I'll be there in the front row. Um, at a theater near me. You see me wearing my Black Panther t-shirt today in honor of Chadwick Bozeman and me doing this story here today. So I'll be there for Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever. Um, it's a deep, the, the first Black Panther was a deep movie on multiple levels. I've done lectures dealing with the film. I did um, about three months of research to be able to do my lectures on the film Black Panther. We also know Wakanda is a real word as well. Wakanda means possesses secret powers in the Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian languages. Uh, Native American languages is also a bad two language as well as Key Congo uh, also. So it's a deep movie on multiple levels. All right, you listen to the African History Network show, Michael and Hotel. When we come back, we'll talk about three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre received a donation of $1 million uh, last week. It's a great story. And then we'll let you hear what happened. You listen to the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. This is Central Park. Stand by. All right. Back from break to four minutes. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. You can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by to get ready for this next segment. All right, who still needs to register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays? On Sunday, it's ancient, on Saturday, it's ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We had a great class this past weekend. As soon as you register, you can watch it. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. Back from break in two minutes. Stand by. Back from break in one minute. So, 
Southern African History Network show. We do current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take it out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do a piece what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future of radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is uh, Monday, May 23rd, 2022, and we are live. All right, the call in number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so I, I, I saw this story. Um, Last week, uh, I saw an article from the Washington Post Wednesday, May 18th, 2022, dealing with the uh, three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. And we were going to talk about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered when I was on on Friday, but we ran out of time, did not get a chance to get to this story. So I said I definitely wanted to talk about it uh on the show today we had a jam-packed show on sunday did not get a chance to get to this so the uh last known survivors of the 1921 uh tulsa race massacre received a one million dollar donation on wednesday may 18th from a philanthropic uh organization a substantial sum for the three centenarians more than 100 years after uh, white mobs destroyed their community. We're going to go to clip. Uh, we're going to clip two here in just a minute here, Shakita. Uh, clip two from KJRH TV2 out of uh, Oklahoma. They have a good story on this also. Okay, so. Uh, Paula Fletcher, just turned 108 years old, Leslie Benningfield Randall, 107, and Hughes' Uncle Red Van Ellis um, accepted the donation Wednesday afternoon at the Greenwood Cultural Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was presented by Ed Mitson, Ed Mitson, co-founder of the U New York-based uh, nonprofit uh, organization business for good business for good now uh, viola fletcher was seven years old when white mobs uh attacked the african-american neighborhood of greenwood a thriving business district known as black wall street this was in north tulsa uh what separated north tulsa from south tulsa was were the railroad tracks this was a thriving business district uh, that, that started at the intersection of Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. So it's believed this is where the Gap Band gets their name from because they're from Tulsa, Oklahoma, GAP Gap. So the massacre killed as many as uh, three hundred, as many as three hundred. It, it killed at least three hundred. The number of three hundred came from the American Red Cross. The American Red Cross set up a makeshift hospital i think it was in the, the booker t washington high school because there was still a few buildings that were still standing so the uh, the american red cross set up a makeshift hospital so the numbers of 300 killed came from the uh, red cross but we know there were also stories of african americans fleeing to other towns and dying in other towns so the number is most likely higher than 300. So 300 is a conservative number, but we know that uh, you had at least 300 uh, killed and, and uh, more than 10,000 were displaced. 10,000 were homeless in the days after the massacre. In, in the days after the massacre ended on uh, June uh, 1st, 1921, hundreds of massacre survivors were rounded up at gunpoint and marched into internment camps according to survivors tes testimony so they had to wear green identification tags and they could only leave the camp if uh like you had a lot of them who worked in south tulsa and worked for white people they were maids butlers things like this domestics what have you so if they were go 
if they were going to work in South Tulsa for a white person, they could leave, but they had to wear green identification tags also. Uh, no white person was ever arrested or charged for involvement in the Tulsa race massacre. Also, the insurance policies didn't pay out on the homes or the businesses uh, either. Now, in May 2021, Viola Fletcher, also known as Mother Fletcher, the oldest known uh, massacre survivor, testified before Congress and demanded justice for survivors and their descendants. She said, I will never forget the violence um, of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men being shot, black bodies lying in the street. Um, I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Uh, our, our country may forget this history, but I cannot. Okay, I want to go to this clip here. This is from uh, KJRH TV2 out of Oklahoma. This deals with the uh, $1 million donation that was given to them. Let's go to clip two, please, Shakita. Two at five, a New York nonprofit donated $1 million to the last three remaining survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. Two News Oklahoma's Naomi Kidd explains how the money will help these families. Karen, I got a chance to talk with the grandson of one of the survivors. He says this money will not only help with their day-to-day -day expenses, but will also allow them to do things they've always wanted, like travel. At 108, 107, and 101, the last three remaining survivors of the Tulsa race massacre have seen a lot. A first, though, was this million-dollar check presented to Viola Fletcher, Leslie Randall, and Hughes Van Ellis. We're trying to extend their life and make them comfortable at this age. Ike Howard is Viola Fletcher's grandson. He says the money will help in several ways as he takes care of both the wants and needs of these centurions. They want to go and see things. They want to go to historical black colleges. They want to go to different events and do things. They said the mind is still fresh, but the body uh, needs a little adjustment. It was a packed house at the Greenwood Cultural Center Wednesday as family and friends and community members witnessed the donation firsthand. New York nonprofit, the Business for Good Foundation, is behind the big check. Founder Ed Mitson and his wife Lisa said it was important for them to give to the survivors. They were clearly wronged. I don't think there's any argument about that. And the fact that it was 101 years ago shouldn't negate the fact that they, they, you know, they, they were wrong. Mitzvah told me she simply wanted to brighten their day and make them realize people do care and their struggle matter. I felt a little bit of frustration that uh, it was so hard for these folks to try to get what Obviously, I felt like they were entitled to. Nixon says it's the first donation they've made outside of New York. Ike Howard also told me some of that money will be used to help their great-grandchildren through college. I'm Naomi Kitt, 2 News, Oklahoma. All right. So great story there. Great work. Donation definitely needed. I know uh, during the 100th commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre, I know they uh, there was donations. An African American organization gave donations, something like a hundred thousand dollars or something, something like that. We talked about that here on this show as well. Here's a check of uh, Hugh Van Ellis, Uncle Red, with the one million dollar uh, check uh, there. So uh, we'll give you as we get more information on this, we'll let you know about that as well. There was a uh, good article from. Um, KJRH TV2 out of uh, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. They have the story on this. So you can read the article also. That clip is in the story and on their YouTube channel. Tulsa Race Massacre survivors get $1 million donation. All right. Now, we know that uh, in, in early May, we told you about their suit, their lawsuit for restitution. In their lawsuit, uh, uh, jumped over a hurdle and their lawsuit is able to continue. Uh, we talked about this back uh, early May. Uh, CNN has this article, Tulsa Race Massacre Reparations Lawsuit Survives Motion to Deny and Will Move, for and will move Forward. Uh, this piece right here from CNN. This was big news also. Uh, May 2nd, 2020 uh may 2nd 2022 
And when we come back from the break, Shakita, we're going to go to clip number three from uh, MSNBC. But we talked about this article here early May. Tulsa race massacre reparations lawsuit survives motion to deny and will move forward, Judge says. This is good news. We're going to let you hear some more details about this when we come back from the break. The plaintiffs in a lawsuit seeking reparations for the 1921 Tulsa race massacre celebrated the judge's ruling uh, on Monday. So that was uh, Monday, uh, May 2nd, uh, 2022, earlier this month, when she allowed their case to move forward after descendants sought a motion to after defendants saw a motion to demit, to dismiss the case. Judge Caroline Wall said the motion to dismiss was uh, the, said the motion to dismiss was granted in part and denied in part, which essentially allows the case to proceed. But it's unclear what will happen next. It's unclear what will happen next. But the, but the lawsuit is still alive. So this is good news including details on a potential trial, according to Michael Schwartz, one of the attorneys for the plaintiffs. The plaintiff's attorneys pleaded Monday afternoon uh, for the judge to allow the case to move forward so the survivors and descendants of victims from the Tulsa race massacre could have their day in court, potentially their last chance to get some semblance of justice. So we'll continue this on the other side of the break. We'll let you hear uh what happened after the uh case was allowed to move forward in court you listen to the african history network show on michael m hotel we'll be back in a few minutes all right stand by back from break in four minutes stand by Back from break in one minute. Stand by. Back from break in one minute. Back from break in one minute. All right, who we have? We have Joya, Espy, Chago, Kenya. Just a few of the people watching. Uh, Nine, ten. The Superstation, Detroit's only African-American talk radio. 
Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on the 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. All right, the call in number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 here's the call in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, be sure to register for the online uh, history classes I teach on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Kemet is one of the original names for Egypt. We do with thousands of thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. This class is going to be Saturday, uh, May 29th. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. As soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did this past weekend. Okay. And we have uh, other content there uh, archived. Um, even after the class is over with, you can go back and watch the entire course. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back. Go back and watch the entire course. It's on sale, eighty dollars. Regularly, one hundred thirty dollars. Okay, uh, I want to go back to this story here. We were talking about, uh, so we talked about the one million dollar donation to the three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre, and then uh, I was going back to a story we covered early uh, May about the lawsuit for reparations that the three survivors have filed. The lawsuit survived the motion to deny and is allowed and the lawsuit will move forward. Now, back on uh, Tiffany Cross's show, May 7th, Saturday, May 7th, 2022, on Tiffany Cross's show, The Cross Connection, she spoke with uh, attorney Demar uh, Demario Solomon Simmons, who's an attorney for the three survivors. And he talked about the case moving forward. Let's go to clip three, please, Shakita. Ukrainians have been blanketed with wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Ukrainians fighting for their lives as, as they're displaced from their homes, having their houses bombed, and countless lives lost. But what if I told you that just over 100 years ago, the exact same thing happened to American citizens right here on American soil? Well, that's exactly what happened when a mob of angry white, uh, an angry white mob armed by local officials descended on 35 blocks in the black area of Tulsa, looting, killing, and burning it to the ground. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seeing being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. She certainly deserves justice, as do all the survivors. And on Monday, an Oklahoma judge ruled that a lawsuit seeking reparations for the 1921 Tulsa race massacre can proceed, bringing hope for some measure of justice. Joining me to talk about this very important story is Demario Solomon Simmons. He's the attorney for the Tulsa survivors and defendants. Demario, my brother, I'm so happy to have you on the show this morning. Tell us what exactly this means for the case going forward. What are the next steps? Absolutely. Tiffany, so good to see you, and thank you for your continued support. Listen, we made history on Monday with the opportunity for the first time in more than 100 years to have a case connected to the Tulsa Race Massacre to move forward in some fashion. That is the good news. Now, we don't know exactly how we're moving forward because we're waiting for the actual written order from our judge, but we are so ecstatic and elated that our survivors and our community has an opportunity to move this case forward. Tiffany, you've met all the survivors. You know them pretty well. They were all in the courtroom at the time. And of course, Mother Fletcher and Mother Randall both been 107. They don't hear as well if you're not talking directly to them. But Uncle Red there in the middle, 101 years old, he hears everything perfectly. And when I looked around and saw that he was bawling like a baby because he finally knows that this is an opportunity to be able to move forward in this case, it was the best possible feeling I've ever had in a professional setting. Well, I'm happy you brought up Uncle Red. I want to play some sound from him when he uh, learned about this ruling. I believe you were seated next to him. He talked to one of uh, our colleagues, uh, uh, Omar Jimenez at CNN. Take a listen. You really feel it deep down to your core. It's been a long time coming. Long time coming. Long time coming. It's going to come. A change is coming. After decades and decades of trying, this is just for a chance. It's never, it's, it's, they never had them like this before. Yeah. And you won't stop till it's done. Won't stop till it's done. We'll not stop. 
We could keep driving. I'm gonna be 130 years old. I'm, I'm, I've been here a long time. We love Uncle Red. We love Uncle Red. Um, listen, you know, I, I've been there with you, uh, Brother DeMario. You know, I've been uh, to the Greenwood District of um, Tulsa. And it is, I mean, just enraging to see what uh, the black folks there experience. Um, and I'm just curious because we've seen what happened there ripple through time and ripple through generations. Uh, Mother Fletcher's children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren were impacted by the wealth that was taken and stolen. And these people were not bothering anybody. They were just living their lives that so outraged the angry people there. Approximately how much wealth do you think was lost when uh, the destruction of Greenwood happened? Well, listen, just talking about the property damage alone, just the property damage, not the lives, not the, not the uh, business opportunities. Property damage is, uh, according to Harvard University, is over $200 million just in property damage alone. So when you start factoring in the the hundreds of thousands, the hundreds or what we, we believe to be thousands of lives that were lost. When you talk about the loss of, of wealth of a generation, when you think about a person like Davy Stratford, who owned the largest African-American owned hotel in the nation at the time, was a multimillionaire, had all his properties burnt to the ground, and then he was ran out of Tulsa as a, as a refugee. He could not come back because they bogusly put indictments on him as saying he was the reason behind the massacre. So he lost everything. So just imagine instead of, in, in addition, to see in Marriott's and Hyatt's and Hilton's and, yeah. and those uh, type of hotels, you would see Stratford's all over the nation. You, know, you take people like Dr. A.C. Jackson, who's considered the, the finest Negro, quote-unquote, Negro surgeon in the nation, or, or attorney A.J. Smitherman that owned the Tulsa Star, which was the largest, I mean, the first African-American publication or newspaper to have a national circulation. Once again, everything burnt to the ground, and he was ran out of Tulsa, never to return because they put false indictments on him. It's Not awful, awful tomorrow. In terms of so. Well, um, I, I want to point out to um, uh, the Chamber of Commerce um, attorney, John Tucker, um, he was asked about this, and essentially he said that the massacre was horrible, um, but the nuisance is not ongoing, and what happened in 1921 was a really bad deal, and those people did not get a fair shake, but that was 100 years ago. Um, if I stole uh, money from somebody 50 years ago, um, I still think a judge might say, hey, you need to run him back his coins because because you stole something from him. It essentially, it sounds like he's saying, why are you bringing up old stuff? And how disrespectful, how disrespectful to these three people who are over 100 years old uh, who survived this level of white supremacy and terror, and terror. Just curious your, what you would respond um, to Mr. Tucker with. What I'll respond is that what we showed in court that the president of the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce, Mike Neal, admitted in 2019 that the, G the Chamber of Commerce uh, activities during the massacre and since the massacre is a direct result of the, of the economic disparities that are in Tulsa today within the Greenwood District specifically. So he can say what he wants to say. The reality is that their leadership recognized, as you know, uh, Tiffany, the mayor has said the same thing, that the racial and economic disparities that we see in Tulsa today is a direct result of the 1921 race massacre. Here's the deal. Oklahoma's nuisance law allows us to say if, if a nuisance was created and if that nuisance is ongoing and to, uh, and to it's fixed or abated, then yeah. we have a valid claim. Think about it yeah, in this manner. Yeah, we do. Well, we're... Yeah, well, I, I want to let you make that point tomorrow, but we're out of time, so you'll have to come back. Um, we're way over time. But thank you not only for being here this morning, but for the work that you do and your continued fight. You always say uh, justice is your ministry. So uh, keep fighting, good brother. We appreciate you. All right. So that was from Saturday, May 7th, 2022. The Cross Connection, Tiffany Cross, MSNBC, speaking with attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. And uh, you'll see if you watch Roland Martin and Filter, Demario is usually on, was he on Tuesday or Wednesday? I think he's on Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm on Friday as a panelist. I think Demario's on usually Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay. Now, when, uh, we're, you know, pretty soon we'll, it will be, it will be time again for the uh, commemoration of the Tulsa race massacre. We know that president Joe Biden uh, did a proclamation uh, for June 1st in uh, 2020, uh, recognizing the 100th commemoration. And he uh, did a proclamation naming uh, June 1st as a national day of uh, remembrance or commemoration. I forgot how he, how he put it. It's at whitehouse.gov. So 
we talked about this here on our show when this happened. Okay. <clears throat> For people who don't remember, some people think uh, President Joe Biden just went there and gave a speech. No, he also announced two important policies to deal with com uh, combating the racial wealth gap. How many people remember me talking about this? This article here from Axios.com, Biden unveils plan to combat racial wealth gap on the anniversary of Tulsa massacre. So there are a number of different articles written about this. I hear people talking about Biden's speech, but they don't talk about these policies that Biden announced also while he was in Tulsa. Um, if we look at this here quickly, um, let's see. Uh, the initiatives will target home ownership and small business ownership, which the White House called two key wealth creators for communities of color, two key, two key wealth creators for communities of color. Quote, because disparities in wealth compound like an interest rate, the disinvestment in black communities in Tulsa and across the country throughout our history is still felt sharply today, the White House said in a statement. Now, the Department of Housing and Urban Development will publish two new rules that will align federal enforcement practice, will align, align federal enforcement practice with the Fair Housing Act and provide a legal framework for HUD, Housing uh, Department of Housing, Urban Development, to require public and private entities to rethink established practices that contribute to or perpetuate inequities. President Biden will also direct HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge to lead an interagency effort to address inequities in housing appraisals, housing appraisals, which is extremely important because housing appraisals is, is one of the ways that a lot of our wealth is stolen. We already know that African-American homes are valued at $156 billion less than comparable white homes. The average African-American home is valued at $48,000 less than comparable white homes. This is the research coming from the Brookings Institute and Andre Perry. We've talked about this here on this show. In housing appraisals, using potential enforcement under fair housing laws, regulatory action, and development of standards and guidance. Okay, we'll continue this another side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Back from break in four minutes. Stand by. All right, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN Show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, etc. Back from break in three minutes. Stand by. Back for break in two minutes.
Stand by. Back from breaking one minute. Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right, uh, right before the break, we were talking about the this article here from Axios.com. And this came out uh, during the 100th commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And it dealt with Joe Biden's speech in Tulsa, but more importantly, two uh, policies Biden was announcing to help combat the racial wealth gap. Somehow, when we talk about Biden's speech there in Tulsa, this gets left out. Very few people really talk about this. We don't. We talked about this here on this show and looked at a number of different articles dealing with this. Also, Andre Perry of the Brookings Institute commented on these policies and said they were necessary and they would help. There are other things that we need, of course, but these policies would definitely, definitely help. Now, <clears throat> the Department of Housing and Urban Development will publish two new rules that will align federal enforcement practice with the Fair Housing Act. Okay, we talked about that before the break. Biden will also direct HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge to lead an interagency effort to address inequities in housing appraisals using potential enforcement under fair housing laws, regulatory action, and development of standards and guidance. The administration said it will increase the share of federal contracts, increase the share of federal contracts directed to small disadvantaged businesses by 50% by 2026, seeking to lower barriers to entry and allow more traditionally underserved entrepreneurs to compete. Our businesses have to take advantage of this. A lot of people don't know about this, okay? Our businesses have to take advantage of this. Now, the White House says the investments will result in an additional $100 billion going to these businesses in five years. The investments will result in an, in an additional one hundred billion dollars going to these businesses in five over the, over five years. Uh, Biden will also announce new details on ten billion dollar on uh, on the ten billion dollar community revitalization fund included in his infrastructure proposal. Now we know the infrastructure bill passed. The infrastructure bill passed after. This article was written after uh, June 1st, 2021, okay? The fund will target communities that suffer from the effects of persistent poverty, historic economic disinvestment, and ongoing displacement of long-term, uh, of, of long-time residents, the White House said. Another proposal will support planning, removal, or retrofitting existing transportation infrastructure that creates a barrier to community connectivity. We talked about that on yesterday's show, on Sunday's show, because that's part of the infrastructure bill to address, to, to, be, to, to, to start repairing the damage that the highways did to the African-American community, driving expressways through the African-American community and separating them like it did the Buffalo East Side uh, community where the tops of uh, grocery store is. OK, so read this article here. These are things that President Biden announced while he was in Tulsa, but very few people talk about this. Also, you can read this article here from um, uh, Washington Post. We talked about this as well back uh, June 1st, June 2nd, when this piece came out as well. At Tulsa event, Biden announces Harris will lead push for voting protections in response to state's recent ballot restrictions. Now, if you go down to page three, it deals with these policies also that I just talked about that very few people for some reason mentioned I, I don't I, it's so it, it, yesterday we looked at the 19 page document at whitehouse.gov that shows how the policies of the biden harris administration are helping african americans very few people talk about this i i'm still trying to figure out why because i listen to radio shows you know i listen to reverend al sharpton show and it, people call in with no evidence talking about things that are 
not happening or what have you just citing no evidence thing just just nonsense i'm i'm not sure where they're getting all this disinformation misinformation from but it has to stop so um let me see here where is i want this right here as he commemorated the massacre biden outlined also outlined new steps to close the wealth gap between black and white americans according to a report by the center for american um let's see according to a report according to the center for american progress the median wealth of white households is 189,000 uh $100 in 2019 compared with $24,100 for black households. Median is the point the statistical measure where 50% of the population is above a certain point and 50% is below the point. Now the gap widened in 2020 as the pandemic hit minority communities harder than white ones according to the report from the uh Center for uh, Center for American Progress. Now uh, President Biden detailed a raft of policies intended to bolster home ownership and help minority small businesses and entrepreneurs, including using federal purchasing power to pump more money into minority owned businesses and setting aside $10 billion in infrastructure funds, setting aside $10 billion in infrastructure funds to rebuild disadvantaged neighborhoods. He also plans to show up the Fair Housing Act in ways that would allow the government to better enforce the law with the goal of increasing black home ownership okay the policies some of which had already been announced were intended to show that the president was taking action not just engaging in a commemoration to support the black community in tulsa and elsewhere the policies will affect the entire country but they are designed to boost communities like tulsa administration officials said during a conference call with reporters monday night now um derek johnson of the naacp uh commented on uh the initiative the, the policies biden talked about other people commented on these as well andre perry was one of them for the brooks institute he said uh derek johnson president of the naacp said components of the plan are encouraging but it fails to address the student loan debt crisis that disproportionately affects African-Americans. We know that by August 31st, Biden is going to announce uh, student loan forgiveness. They're working on the executive order now. We've been talking about that here on the show. And we've also been dealing with the um, student loan debt that's already been forgiven. It's about three, $23 billion, about 800,000 people. Uh, so check that out now. The, uh, the Forbes.com has uh, articles on that that we talked about here on this show as well. Read this here at whitehouse.gov because uh, we, we mentioned it uh, briefly yesterday and I showed you some information in here. And this is the fact sheet at whitehouse.gov. The Biden-Harris administration advances equity and opportunity for black people and communities across the country. This, this was updated February 28, 2022. It's a 19-page document. It goes through step-by-step step and shows you how the policies of the Biden-Harris administration are helping African-Americans. So you don't have to guess, okay? You can go read. This is at whitehouse.gov. All right, be sure to register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching for a few more minutes. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by. Stand by. Okay, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it says michael and shows my picture there these other ones here are fake african history network cash app accounts here's our cash app link in the yellow paypal donate button uh the sisters keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting uh, pay some of the bills also and then you can register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Saturdays is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Sundays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We also deal with the Haitian Revolution in that class and the um, uh, Louisiana Purchase. 
uh, as well. We do with the Haitian Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase. And we talked some about the Haitian Revolution um, on our show Sunday and how France in 1825 forced Haiti to start paying reparations to France. Uh, Haiti paid the equivalent of uh, $560 million uh, to, to, uh, to France as a result of the Haitian Revolution. Okay, we're going to post the information here so you can um, register for the online classes. Post this right here. Then we have to get out of here. All right. Also, African Liberation Day is coming up. I'll be speaking to African Liberation Day. Um, I'll, I'll be there Saturday at the uh, Kibalan Village. Let me see here. I'll be there Saturday at, at El Kibalan Village. We had uh, Greg McKenzie on from uh, the African Liberation Day commu uh, Committee. We had him on our show Sunday to talk about this. Uh, so you can go to uh, ALDDetroit.org for more information. ALDDetroit.org uh, for more information. It's taking place uh, Friday. Uh, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, Friday, May 27th. And then Saturday, May 28th, uh, it's taking place, what time, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Alkibalan Village, 7701 um, Burner Highway, it was a 7701 Harper, 7701 Harper, okay, Alkibalan Village. So I'll be there Saturday. I'm doing a presentation on Saturday. I'll be a vendor there also. So visit ALDDetroit.org for more information. We'll get that up at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk.